Hi guys, Brendan here, and this is the weekly update, where I review news stories from the past week that I think are interesting and relevant to the overall goal of this channel. And as a reminder, the goal of this channel is to help you reach financial independence and give you the option to retire early. And I do this in a number of ways, but one way is to go over current affairs in the world of finance. So let's get into it. So unfortunately, there is a lot of negative news to sift through this week, but there are a few positive things which I'll touch on towards the end. So economic data continued to be awful this week. GDP in the first quarter fell at its worst rate since the last recession, and consumer spending has hit its lowest rate since 1959. The Federal Reserve did say it would do whatever it takes to help in this situation. In the markets, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500 are up about 2.5% this week, while small caps have come back with vengeance. The Russell 2000 is up 6.3% this week. This is good news for anyone who followed my recommendations in a recent video about the best science-based investment strategy. If you haven't seen that, you can view it here. Following the S&P 500's best monthly performance since 1987 at positive 12.68% in April, it was a little down to end the week. And this is largely because tech companies' earnings highlighted the pandemic's toll even on its biggest companies. Amazon, widely considered to be a recession-proof stock, had record revenues this quarter, but disappointed in profits. And this was because of higher virus-related costs, things like employee testing and higher wages. And as I mentioned earlier, in March, consumer spending, which is the U.S. economy's key driver, posted its steepest monthly decline ever, dropping 7.5%. Consumer spending accounts for more than two-thirds of the entire country's economic output. Now, on the upside, because consumers are being more cautious, they're saving more and have hit the highest saving rate at 13.1% in March since 1981. Meanwhile, the U.S. economy shrank at its fastest rate in the first quarter since the fourth quarter of 2008. Gross domestic product, the broadest measure of goods and services produced across the economy, contracted at an annual rate of 4.8% in the first quarter. The decrease in the demand for oil due to the shelter-in-place rules has had its effect on oil giants ExxonMobil and Chevron. ExxonMobil actually posted its first quarterly loss in over three decades, at down $610 million. As a comparison, this time last year, they had a profit of $2.4 billion. Personally, I believe that this is just the beginning of corporate earnings suffering due to virus-related effects. In other news, on Saturday, Warren Buffett, the chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, stated that he sold all of the company's holdings in U.S. airline stock. He admitted that the virus changed the business in a very major way. Berkshire sold its stake in United, American, Southwest, and Delta Airlines. It was total about $6 billion that it sold out. Originally, it had a 10% stake in these four major U.S. airlines. In a shareholder meeting on Saturday, Mr. Buffett said, and it turned out I was wrong about that business because of something that was not in any way the fault of four excellent CEOs. The airline business, and I may be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, I think it changed in a very major way. And it's obviously changed in the fact that their four companies are each going to borrow perhaps average of at least 10 or 12 billion each. I don't know that three, four years from now, people will fly as many passenger miles as they did last year. You've got too many planes. Also last week, over 3.8 million Americans filed for unemployment benefits. This brings the total to over 30 million Americans since the pandemic started. Part of the problem is that many states are using decade-old technology to process all of these claims. The archaic technology has caused many states to fall behind in processing these claims, with hundreds of thousands of Americans still waiting to receive checks. These problems indicate that the official tally of claims is likely higher. Over 600,000 people tried to file claims last week, but were unable due to long wait times. And 5 million people who did file claims are still waiting on a decision. And 2.6 million people who were successful in their claims are still waiting for their first check. Now, the slightly good news is that claims have begun to ease. They're down about 44% from their peak of 6.9 million on March 28th. And 46 states have indicated that claims have gone down since the end of March. And moving on with some other maybe good news, depending on your stance, several states have begun reopening. Georgia began reopening last week, and several other states have followed suit this week. Here's a map showing where each state stands. At least 30 states have begun allowing some businesses to operate or announce plans to do so in May. But with reopenings are many different opinions on how we should be reopening. There really isn't a perfect answer, as everyone is trying to balance the medical and economic risks. Some states are eagerly lifting restrictions, while other states are saying that relaxation and social distancing could be weeks away. And really, Central America is lifting the restrictions faster, and the coastal states are keeping the social distancing in place. When South Korea began reopening its economy last month, the government issued strict guidelines from everything to how people should be sitting in restaurants, side by side or diagonally rather than straight across, to how loud you're allowed to speak in a grocery store so that your spit doesn't fly as far. 
Here in the US, the government issued broad voluntary guidelines for how states should begin reopening. The three-phased approach suggests that states should meet certain criteria before they begin reopening. One of these is that they should have a decline in cases over the last 14 days. Now, governors have been told that they are given complete discretion over how and when their states can begin to reopen. Some states that have allowed businesses to reopen have imposed restrictions on the number of people allowed in their stores or restaurants. In Texas, for example, restaurants are only allowed to operate at 25% capacity. This has caused many restaurants just to not open because they don't think they'll be profitable. The state lockdown orders have led some to push back in the form of protests, while others are still very hesitant. Polls have shown that Americans in general are nervous to go back to public places. An online survey run by Danata, a consumer research firm, found that among people who normally eat at sit-down restaurants, 60% said they would wait at least a month or longer before returning to restaurants. And of those, 15% said that they would wait at least six months. For movies, over 75% of people said they would wait at least a month or more before going back to theaters. And of those, 25% said they would wait over six months. This response will likely hurt the profitability of these businesses once they reopen. I spoke last week about a few large retailers who were choosing not to reopen stores in Georgia where the restrictions were relifted. And this was partially due to fears that they wouldn't be profitable due to limited customers. And also they were worried about rehiring employees some of which who may be making more money on unemployment insurance than they were when they were working. But since then, several of these retailers are already starting to enact plans to reopen their stores. Macy's, for example, is planning to reopen 68 stores on Monday in states that have already lifted their restrictions. They plan to open all of their 775 locations within the next six weeks. So other good news is that there's potential for virus treatments. The FDA authorized use of Gilead Sciences drug Rindesivir in virus patients. The drug is proven to moderately shorten recovery times in virus patients. Remdesivir patients have a recovery time of about 11 days, which is four days shorter than the placebo group. Remdesivir is an antiviral drug previously tested for treatment on Ebola. There is currently a race for a vaccine, but the urgency has many researchers navigating safety issues, commercial challenges, and geopolitical tensions. Seven of the roughly 90 vaccine projects that are currently being pursued have reached the stage of clinical trials. This is extremely fast to reach the stage and raises safety concerns. Now I'd like to leave you with some more uplifting news before I go. With the shelter in place order in effect, many newscasters are having to broadcast from home and the challenges are, are pretty funny. Now I'll show you two of them here. The first is a weatherman from Tampa whose golden retriever Brody wanted to interrupt his broadcast to say hi. Check it out. Come here, buddy. You just messed the Come up here for a second. Just come up. Come up here. Come up. Up, 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 up. The maps aren't going to move because he just whacked uh, the computer with his head. So let me, let me just verbalize the forecast, okay? That wasn't, a, that wasn't very smart. We'll have clouds overnight tonight with temps uh, in the 60s. Then tomorrow, mix of clouds and sun, a couple of showers, uh, and temperatures will top off uh, in the, uh, probably the, like the mid-80s. And then coming up on uh, Friday and Saturday, Partly cloudy, turning more humid uh, with temperatures again in the, in the mid-80s. Didn't mean to keep you up. Next time, buddy, we're going to eat after this. So that's the forecast. Uh, I will be back uh, at, at 445 with, oh, boy. Oh, boy. You know, he's, 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 he's jumping up looking for Craig outside the window. Oh, don't oh, take boy. this the wrong way, oh, Paul, boy. but yeah. this is amazing oh, and great. Boy. I love it. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> Uh, that that's we don't need to see that that forecast map we'll just look at brody <laughs> 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 just made uh, hello he loves craig <laughs> <laughs> he likes craig so craig is hidden on the outside he's on the on the porch and and he's got a kind of a, a blanket up so the reflection doesn't get into the into my room here and now he can't see craig so he's going crazy trying to find craig behind the blanket so uh, thanks for bearing with us. We'll have your complete forecast, including all the little graphics coming up at 445. Back to you, Linda. That's all right, Brody. We enjoyed every moment of that. Odie, what are you doing? Odie. Oh, he just wanted to say hi. And he wouldn't leave me alone, so now he's here with me. But at least that last guy was wearing pants, which is more than this next one can say. On Good Morning America, this is actually Christopher Reeve's son. Christopher Reeve used to play Superman, but he thought he would only be seen from the waist up. And unfortunately for him, that wasn't the case. Here it is for your viewing pleasure. Companies do say they will scale up the program if it is successful, guys. Very cool. We love it, Will. Thank you. Unfortunately, there was a lot of negative news this week. But with states reopening and vaccines in the work, hopefully we have some good news soon. Let me know in the comments below what you thought about these stories. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe and hit the little bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. Have a great week. Take care.